designed primarily for folks who want to be investigating and potentially bringing the civil cases uh, that allege fraud and misconduct. We have a group of people, uh, I will do just sort of an overall introduction, who actually did things. So this isn't uh, an academic panel of people theorizing. Uh, this is people talking about real world experience plus theory uh, that they learned out of those things. And I'd like to introduce uh, new to University of Missouri, uh, Kansas City, the head of this here endeavor, uh, and Rafe Foreman, who is head of our advocacy efforts uh, that are developing here. So you'll be able to, if you're natives, to get to, to see and know him uh, a great deal. I'm going to go first uh, because Chris's PowerPoint is somewhere in the ether, uh, and because I have to dash and make a talk in the other one in 45, 50 minutes uh, and such. So I'll get kicked off and uh, I'll tell you why the phrase autopsy began. That's actually the term we used back in the day in the savings and loan crisis to describe the process of what we were doing. So if you went back to that era, which is the 1980s, the uh, 1984 when uh, I arrive at the agency, everybody knows what the problem is with savings and loans. And the problem, of course, is interest rates. Interest rates go on up and savings and loans die because they're exposed to interest rate risk. So this is a classic example of being prepared to fight the last war instead of the current war. Uh, so we actually look, and who are we? We're the litigation division of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. I'm the new litigation head. And so every failure comes across your desk as a litigation director because you have to be ready to defend against a challenge to the appointment of the receiver. And you have to be able to say, should we be suing anybody, officers, directors, professionals, out of this. So you have to do an investigation. You have to learn how the, what the examinations have found. You have to learn accounting and appraisal stuff and all those good types of things, none of which you're taught in law school, obviously. And we called that process the autopsy process. And I was informally referred to as the chief coroner simply because my job was as the head uh, litigator. So what did we learn and why was that different? It was different because what was happening and it just kicked in was very substantial deregulation of the savings and loan industry in the Garn St. Germain Act of 1982 at the federal level, which kicked off a competition for laxity, that's what it was called, uh, in the trade, uh, with the states. And the overall combination produced very substantial deregulation, in particular in Texas and in California. And the head of the agency, the guy that designed the deregulation bill, was an academic economist, Dick Pratt. And Dick Pratt, being a good economist, knew that what you did to make decisions was to do econometric studies. Now, econometrics is just a fancy word for statistics in the economics context. But it had some really perverse results. And I'll just talk briefly about two of them. And the reason I'm going to bother to talk about them is that this is often what you're up against at trial with their expert witness. Right? So their expert witnesses will frequently be relying on this kind of reasoning because in economics it is thought of as the peak of science. The, and indeed economists tend to think of themselves as by far the best statisticians in the economic world. I'm sorry, in the social science world. So. We will do the swing around. I came for CLE and the guy started talking about stats. It's crazy. Okay, so Dick Pratt, being a good economist, wants to know we run a natural experiment. We have a federal government and we have a bunch of different states. Which savings and loans are doing the best? And so they do a study of all the states, and one is better than ever anybody else. And it is one that Rafe knows a whole lot about, and I know a bit about, because I taught for years 
at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. Texas is top of the charts. Absolutely the best place in the nation and by a significant margin when you do the studies. So, you go forward in time, about eight years, and you have the savings and loan debacle and 40 to 45 percent of the total losses of the entire debacle occur in Texas. It would have been hard to pick a worse possible model. So, what's going on? Right. What's going on is accounting fraud. And for that, we swing around again. So here's the recipe that maximizes accounting fraud at a bank or other lender. And this recipe turned out to be the most useful thing in many ways to making our cases, identifying the problems. So it's a simple four ingredient recipe. One, grow like crazy. Two, make really crappy loans, but at a premium yield. Three, extreme leverage, that just means a lot of debt compared to your equity. And four, have trivial reserves, what we call in accounting jargon, your all. That's your allowance for loan and lease losses. And to do this stuff, you have to actually learn a, at least a bit of accounting, because that's where all the magic is. Right? We call these things in criminology control frauds because it's the person who controls a seemingly legitimate organization. In the finance world, the weapon of choice is accounting. And this is how they do it. So your allowance for loan and lease losses is something that under U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, you're supposed to do at the time you make the loan. Not later at the time you make the loan, and it's supposed to reflect the risks of the loan that you're actually making, not some hypothetical loan of good quality as well. And that's going to be important as we get through the story. Akerlof and Romer, it's nice that we have a Nobel laureate on our side when we're making these cases. Call this <clears throat> a sure thing. And what they mean is if you follow this recipe, you are mathematically guaranteed to report not just high profits, but actually record profits off the chart. And that's what uh, Phil Angelides was just talking about. How the entities doing this don't just report nice profits, they're extraordinary. And he was saying that the regulators were telling him, well, how could we act against these entities if they're reporting record profits? Well, think of what it was like back in the savings and loan days. Um, so Bill Black walks into the courtroom as a litigation director, and the judge says, let me get this straight. You want to close down the most profitable savings and loan in America. That's right, Your Honor. And you've got 500 savings and loans reporting that they're insolvent on a gap, generally accepted accounting principle basis. That's right, Your Honor. But you're not here to close any of those. No, Your Honor. You want to close the most profitable one that's showing virtually no losses. Yes, Your Honor. Well, I knew government regulators were insane, but I'd never seen you know anything in your court. So that is precisely the folks we targeted. And that was viewed as absolutely crazy and to be to use polite language. All right? So what's a sure thing? The first thing that is a sure thing is if you do these four things, you must report extraordinary profits. The second thing that is a sure thing is that you're going to have, with modern executive compensation, extraordinary income to your senior officers. And the third thing, if you think of it again, what if I tried to create a formula that would maximize real losses? It would be precisely this formula that would maximize the real losses as well. So that is the terrible paradox, that it is the worst possible lending strategy that will produce the highest compensation 
to the senior officers. And that is precisely what has happened recurrently. It happened in the savings and loan crisis where the equivalent commission, which I was the deputy staff director, found at the typical large failure, savings and loan failure, fraud was invariably present. That's a direct quotation from them. Nobody doubts that in the Enron era as well, right? That those were all frauds emanating from the top of the organization. James Pierce, who is a, was deceased now, but was a banking expert and banking historian, in his book says that insider, senior insider fraud has long been historically the uh, leading cause of bank failures in the United States. So the question is, why did we hit this crisis and decide it was the first virgin crisis, conceived without sin uh, of any kind, right? Uh, it makes absolutely no sense a priori. So let's look at this formula. The first two elements are highly related, right? We would love to make, to grow extraordinarily rapidly by making really great loans at a high yield, right? That would be a wonderful way to run a bank. That'd be exceptionally profitable. And there are only two problems with that. Most markets, and banking is one of them, are at least reasonably competitive, and most markets are fairly mature. So this is not like coming out and developing an iPod where you can sell potentially three billion of them. Now, houses have been around a very long time. And banking, as I say, especially when you talk about mortgage bank lending uh, for mortgages, is really quite a competitive industry and has been for a very long time. So here's a thought exercise. What happens if we tried to grow extremely rapidly by making really high quality loans? Right? We, and by extremely rapidly, I'm talking about growth rates above 25% and often above 50%. Can we do that by making really good loans? What would we need to do to be able to pick up a 50% increase in you'd size? Have to, you'd have to compete in the marketplace again. So we, for those limited number of borrowers who would qualify. As, so as how would we pick up 50% more business? By lowering your yield. You're lowering you your yield. And in a reasonably competitive marketplace, what's likely to happen from my competitors? They're going to match your rates. And at the end of the day, is this a good way for us to maximize accounting income? Oh, it does the opposite, right? It slashes accounting income throughout the industry. So it's a strategy that cannot work. It's a, in logic, it's a fallacy of composition uh, problem, right? What happens if we instead grow very rapid, try to grow very rapidly by making really bad loans? How many people are there in the world who can't afford to repay their home or won't? Tens of millions of those folks, right? And so, how are those people, are those people able to buy homes normally? No. So, demand, if you think of the good old law, economics and supply and demand curves and all that good stuff, right? That's your demand curve, that's your supply curve. You're constrained by finance. You can't effectively demand a house if you can't get the loan, if you're a relatively poor folks. But if we make loans to people who cannot repay the loans, effectively we right shift the demand curve. And what that does is unambiguously increase price. And it can increase it a lot. For more technical reasons, these things are not necessarily linear. Right, so if I increase effective demand 10, 15, 20 percent, I may have a much greater effect in hyperinflating the bubble. Right? Can I charge a premium yield if I lend to people who can't normally get credit? Yeah. How would I really, really, really maximize this? Who can I get a really superb premium yield? 
people who can't read English very well are a really good target for this. Right? People who have less acquaintance with financial markets, less financial literacy and jargon, are really good targets for this. People have fewer choices because they have fewer connections to the banking industry are very good targets for this. There is, in other words, it was not random when you heard that AmeriQuest deliberately targeted minorities and was found repeatedly by investigations that it deliberately targeted minorities. That is perfectly sensible. So, uh, Phil explained uh, and Wendy explained that the securitization was not a necessary concomitant to creating a crisis. Ireland did not have securitization. Ireland had a bubble twice as big relative to GDP as the United States. Right? But securitization adds a really neat twist that is very useful in terms of fraud. And again, our idea is we've got to be able to detect it, we be, have to be able to investigate it effectively, and we have to be able to prove it in court, where people have <clears throat> these persnickety things like the best lawyers in the world against us because we're suing the CEO, or you should see it when we prosecute uh, the CEO, uh, what they're willing to spend money like water in those circumstances. Right? So we have to find things that a regular jury can understand. You know what? That makes no sense for an honest bank. Nobody honest would proceed in that fashion. That only makes sense if people are involved in crime. So let's add the securitization process. As I said, this was the typical four ingredients, but many people, as you know, added a fifth ingredient, and that was, now let's sell this really crummy loan to others, right? Now, first thing is, in standard economics, and this is going to be fun if they ever put up an expert on the other side, this sale is impossible, right? You're selling loans that are pervasively unbelievably terrible that are going to have huge losses. Yes? Before you go further, can you give a brief definition of securitization? Securitization in this is a, it's a good point. I'm actually just talking about the sale. It turns out that the purchasers, the only one who's likely to purchase a whole loan of this kind, is someone who wants to then create a security that is backed by mortgages. And mortgage-backed securities were the most traditional, and Wendy explained about uh, mortgage-backed securities. But what arose much greater than it ever had been and was overwhelmingly associated with liar's loans was the CDO, the collateralized debt obligation. So we're going to be spending uh, some time on CDOs as well and why they were structured in the way they were, uh, why uh, the frauds, in fact, require that they be uh, structured in this fashion, right? So we're selling this really, really, really crummy security. And what you're going to see is that liar's loans in the studies have a fraud incidence of 90%, okay, nine zero. So as Fitch will say, Fitch is the smallest of the rating agencies. And of course, it only looks in November 1987. Why? I'm sorry, 2007. Why? Because the secondary market has collapsed, and there are no more fees to be gained. It, and I will get it virtually uh, word for word. It is, the results of our review were disconcerting in that there was the appearance of fraud in nearly every file we examined. And then they go on to say, any normal underwriting would have caught this easily because Fitch did not investigate, didn't hire investigators to go out and look at houses and such. It looked at for frauds that were obvious on the face of the documents. And you heard Wendy describe the 2 to 3 percent reviews. Those were all non-investigations as well. They are simply looking for fraud that is essentially obvious on the face of the document. So that is going to massively understate fraud typically. The fact that it didn't massively understate that Fitch was able to find fraud on the face of virtually every document, admittedly a small sample and uh, not random in their case, it is really disconcerting. And it's, again, it's going to be the point. These things could not survive underwriting. 
and that's going to be one of the great markers of fraud that you're going to be able to use <coughs> to inve investigate and prove your fraud, right? That you could not do any real underwriting on these loans. They were so pervasively bad, any real underwriting would have kicked it out. And hence, uh, as Wendy said, when they found bad things, they ignored them. And it's not just Wendy saying that. The Federal Housing Finance Administration has recently filed 17 complaints, collectively about 1,500 pages, in which they say that's exactly what happened at 17 of the largest banks in the United States of America. They had this fairly <coughs> flaky review, and even the fairly flaky review found massive noncompliance and fraud. And here's the critical thing for trying it, and that there is a paper trail establishing that they knew it and sold it anyway under false reps. I'm sorry, who, who just came out with this? Statement? Federal Housing Finance Administration. This is the 17 civil suits that it brought alleging fraud against 17 of the largest banks in the United States of America. Available online, free, uh, that you can get these things. One of so, which is right here. <laughs> one of which is right here. Okay, now back to the, we want to sell this stuff, right? We're a mortgage broker. Now, here's the first thing you need to know about this, and it's in the testimony in front of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. And that is, the prior job of many a mortgage broker was literally flipping burgers, right? So they went from flipping burgers to flipping houses in all of this. You could get, as a fee, as a broker, for a, what, we, uh, what we call a jumbo mortgage, so that's $600,000, $800,000, uh, range, you know, very big for here, but only moderately big for California, uh, you could get a $20,000 fee as a mortgage broker. And your last job was flipping burgers. You got it? We pretty much know how this story is going to work, right? So, the art form, uh, and again, if you think of it in a mathematical sense of elegance, if you wanted the most elegant fraud selling this stuff, you want to make something occur that is supposedly impossible in markets, and that is you want this stuff to appear to be relatively low risk and extremely high yield. All right, so we already talked about how you get the high yield. You make loans to people who aren't credit worthy and you pick on people in particular who are less financially sophisticated. But now we want to make the loan appear less risky. And there are two key ratios that we need to gimmick. And those are the debt to income and the LTV, which stands for loan to value ratios. Okay? Debt to income, debt's the amount of their borrowing. Income is the borrower's income. So how do you gimmick debt to income? Which way do you want to make it appear? A high or a low ratio? Low, because it looks safer. They're not borrowing very much compared to their income. They have lots of capacity to repay. Even if something happens where they lose their job, they may be, or you know, their best job, they may be able to pay. Right? So that's the direction we want to push this puppy. How do we gimmick a debt to income ratio if we're a mortgage broker and we got 20,000 of pops riding on this? Yes, that we make the borrower appear more have more income. Now, in the old days of the savings and loan, we had in place underwriting rules, not guidelines. Uh, the guidelines came in in 1993, I believe. We got rid of the rule. And the rule said you had to you know, have a contemporaneous written record that the people could actually repay the loan, and you had to maintain that record, right? Mmm, that's bad if you're gimmicking somebody's income. Because what have I just established? <clears throat> like, you know, stick out your wrists, let me put the handcuffs <coughs> on. You have a written record that the person's income is 50000 and then you put in 100000 Right? This is very bad. Uh, as a, So what's the perfect device? You don't ask for papers. Yes, and we call that the liar's loan. Right? So we never create the paper trail on the underwriting of the income. 
because we know if we do, remember, the 90% figure was on false statements of income. So 90% when they looked at the tax returns, 90% of the incomes were inflated. Right? Really high incidence of fraud. Extraordinary incidence of fraud. The other one is the loan to value ratio. Yes, sir. Was any of this paper recourse back to the all of its recourse back virtually to, to to the broker? Not the individual broker, to whatever entity sold it. So virtually everywhere in the chain. One of the great false things that people are told is there was no skin in the game and therefore this happened. In fact, there was skin in the game in virtually all the transactions because of reps and warranties. And indeed, the FHFA suit that I'm talking about is explicitly, you gave this rep and warranty, you knew that was false, there's a paper trail showing you knew it was false, you lied, you blankety blank blank. So, uh, yes, uh, and again, that's why this is impossible under neoclassical economics, because the theory in neoclassical economics is, remember, eventually the most sophisticated buyers in the world are the buyers. The investment banks who are going to pool these securities and create the CDOs, the collateralized debt obligations. So what are the odds that they're going to buy from somebody that they know has this incredibly perverse incentive and was a mortgage broker who was literally flipping burgers the day before and he gets $20,000 if he lies to us? Right? Are we going to believe that? Neoclassical economics says we, the investment bankers, will provide the discipline in the market and make such sales impossible. Instead, they loved to purchase these things for the reasons we're going to fill in the blanks. So, that's why you have the liar's loan. Why is it so incredibly ideal? I can not only make the loan, make the loan at a premium yield, but make the loan appear safer without creating as large a paper trail demonstrating my fraud. Right? Notice, well, let me back up. I will simply say this time-wise if you want to explore this, well, it's be happy to do it. We know that when you lend or grant insurance without underwriting, you create a condition we call in economics adverse selection. And when you're talking so about something as big an extension of credit as mortgages, as opposed to credit cards, and where all the money goes out up front, if you have very substantial adverse selection and you lend, you will lose money. It is the equivalent of going to Las Vegas and betting against the house, except the odds are nowhere near as good when you have 90% fraudulent liars loans, right? You will suffer catastrophic losses. Remember I said that was the other sure thing. This formula, this recipe, will create catastrophic losses. Your institution will fail unless, of course, you're a systemically dangerous institution and you're bailed out by the federal government. Right? But that, and so I am talking about Fannie and Freddie. They are frauds. They are accounting control frauds. And the SEC explicitly charged Fannie in 2006 with being an accounting control fraud. Of course, it got settled with no findings, and of course, the Justice Department didn't prosecute. Okay, back to loan to value. Loan to value, again, the loan is easy. That's the amount of the loan. The value is the appraised value of the house. What kind of ratio do I want? Small or big? Small, right? If I want a small ratio, I want lots of value compared to the loan amount because then even if things go wrong, I'm going to get repaid in full. That's the glory of being a secured lender. How do I in create and gimmick this ratio? That's right. So how can I do that? First, can borrowers easily <coughs> inflate appraisals? No. This is really good in terms of being a lawyer suing against these things. This is what we call one of the markers of fraud by the lender. When you see widespread appraisal fraud, that can't come from lenders, I'm sorry, from borrowers. It can only come from lenders and their agents. Plus, it's an easy fraud to stop if I'm a lender. Right? 
I can have review appraisers, and I can spot these things quite easily and stop it. No honest lender would ever inflate an appraisal. And that's really good in terms of jury appeal. Right? Jurors understand that, and they understand that within about 30 seconds of someone actually explaining it to them. You go, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Right? And in fact, we have really good survey evidence of how many uh, appraisers are, were coerced. And we have investigations. Then Attorney General Cuomo of New York, now Governor Cuomo, found that Washington Mutual had a blacklist of appraisers. But you got on the blacklist if you refused to inflate the appraisal, right? Which is why Washington Mutual is one of the most glorious cases to prosecute you can imagine. And why the fact that there is no prosecution in Washington Mutual tells you everything about what's happening in the modern era. Anyway, so we, we've got it together, right? We have a loan that has a premium yield. If we can find financially unsophisticated folks who can't read English, better yet, we can get an even higher yield empirically, and we make the loan appear less risky so we can sell it. Now, here's the additional footnote to those reviews, right? So when the um, City Corps, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns and such purchased these loans, again, under these incredibly perverse incentives where they're producing endemic fraud, they do do this review that Wendy talked about, but there's another element to the review. They would use the review and the finding that the loans were crappy to negotiate a lower price and then turn around and sell it as great stuff to the next person. Which, of course, again, in terms of jury appeal and such, is very good in, in terms of all of these things. I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Yes. The purchaser, the investment bank, typically, um, but not always, from the mortgage broker, the investment banker would do this 2 to 3% review sample size that Wendy talked about. It would find invariably problems because when you have 90% fraud incidents, you know, even the worst review finds them. They would then frequently, they, the investment bank, use that finding from the quality <coughs> review to go back to the seller, the mortgage broker, or SNL, and say, hey, you sold this under reps and warranties, your point, uh, that were false. We don't want to undo the deal, mind you, but we want a lower price right, in all of this. And then they would turn around and sell it to the rest of the world as AAA best of the world. And again, in terms of a paper trail and in terms of venality and all those good types of things that you look for as a prosecutor or as a uh, plaintiff in a civil uh, action in tort or contract, these are really good things uh, in terms of uh, jury appeal uh, as well. All right, so, okay, so we got frauds and we got things that are really, really fraudulent. Are they major? Uh, now, Wendy said, well, not, you know, it's, it's sort of hyper-technical and time-wise, she was already uh, a little pressed for time, and that she didn't go through the difference between subprime and Alt-A. So, here are the various euphemisms for liar's loans. Alt A, stated income, ninja, Nina, all right? And they have the following meanings. Let me start with the uh, Alt A, because that's the double bright shining lie, all right? So the A part, that means prime. So these are allegedly prime mortgages. And indeed, in many things, you will see them treated, including Fannie and Freddie's books, listed under prime mortgages. You'll find the liar's loans. Well, actually, you won't find the liar's loans, which is sort of the problem, right? <laughs> in terms of securities law, potentially, for them. The ALT stands for alternative. And that bright, shining lie was, this is just an alternative means of underwriting. 
And I guess not un underwriting is an alternative means of underwriting in <laughs> some loosely conceptual fashion. Um, but their theory was that they were relying, or their stated theory, um, is that they were relying on credit scores. All those cable TV commercial ads after 11 p.m. and such. Now, in addition, nobody sentient would rely on credit scores to make home loans for lots of reasons, but let's just stay with one. And that is, does it show the capacity to repay a $500,000 mortgage that you've consistently repaid your $30 electric bill for 12 years? No, it has nothing to do with capacity. It's, you know, it is facially absurd that it could be used as a system. Right? Okay, so we got liar's loans. How many of them are there? And subprime, um, that's supposed to mean you have known credit defects. And how do they figure that out? Well, they did the credit scores again. Okay? But here's the critical mistake. Many people assume that these categories are dichotomous. In other words, there's liar's loans and there's subprime. No. Increasingly, subprime became liar's loans as well. You can not underwrite a really, really bad loan, right? To someone who has known credit defects. And by 2006, the best guess is that half of all the loans called subprime were also liar's loans. And that's important because by 2006, that means roughly 30 to 33% of all loans made that year were liar's loans, which have a 90% fraud incidence. We're talking by then in the 2 million plus range of fraudulent loans being made a year. It also means you heard about um, the death of increased home ownership. You know, the end, not the death, but the end of it being much earlier. In economics, the jargon is always what's happening on the margin. The marginal loans that drove the hyperinflation of the bubble and extended its life for additional years were overwhelmingly liar's loan. We're talking about between 2003 and 2006 an increase in liar's loans of over 500%. So, it look, you know, graph looks like it's just accelerating to the moon in all of this. So they were big enough to drive the, this aspect of the crisis. Wendy went through the arguments about, you know, can, is the housing uh, bubble collapse sufficient to explain the more general collapse? That's not relevant to the CLE portion. I'm not going to go into that here. But it was assuredly large enough to hyperinflate the bubble. And when hyperinflated bubbles go, really bad things happen to the world. And I will add something from criminology that's important. Uh, and that is, as you know, at law, the defining element that distinguishes fraud from other forms of larceny is deceit. So what fraud is all about is I get you to trust me and I betray that trust so that I can gain at your expense. And that means that there's no more effective acid against trust than fraud and particularly elite fraud. So what was happening all over the world was bankers suddenly going, what if my counterparty bank is doing the same thing that I've been doing. And his asset valuations are bullshit. I don't think I'll make this trade. Right? And markets seized up because of the death of trust. And actually, when you ask bankers, that's what they say about the crisis. So fraud isn't just sort of a little thing. It was an enormous story here. As I said, the good news from the plaintiff's standpoint, and should be from the prosecutors, but it's not happening, is that there is a paper trail. The further good news is that there's a whole series of behaviors that make no sense 
for an honest lender. If you're going to follow this recipe, then you have two enormous problems. First, you're not allowed to provide that small uh, an all, that small an allowance when you're making loans that are massively fraudulent and are sure to have massive losses. Your duty under generally accepted accounting principles is to have extraordinarily large reserves. And the failure to do that because gap is included by regulation in the securities law is a violation of the securities law, which is to say it's a felony, which is to say also it's a 10b-5 action, private right of action. Now, you can't go after the aiders and abettors under the current law, but there are plenty of deep pockets out there because of all these pushbacks. Also, there are all these pushback suits, which are collectively hundreds of billions of dollars at, at this point. The other problem, of course, is the second ingredient in the recipe. When you make massive amount of fraudulent loans, well, what is a bank designed to do? A bank, a big bank, would typically have something like 12 different layers of internal controls, all of which are designed to prevent bad loans. And Wendy made the point that all of these things go bad at the same time or essentially the same time, and they must all go bad. Well, we just did the mortgage brokers. Who do you think created the incentive structures for the mortgage broker? Wall Street created those incentive structures, the purchasers. And they did so in written ways in the daily term sheets that said, this is what, what your bonus will be like. How hard was it, do you think, to, for them to figure out exactly what was going to happen if you created that incentive structure? And if it was too hard to do that, how long was it before they got reports that these ended loans were massively fraudulent? Well, you heard Phil uh, emphasize that the FBI warned in September 2004, but the industry's own anti-fraud experts, a group called MARI, and this did this warning in writing, and it went out to every member of the Mortgage Bankers Association, which is to say everybody, essentially. And it said the following three things in 2006. First, these loans are, and I'm quoting, an open invitation to fraudsters. Two, the incidence of fraud is 90%. They reported that study. And three, these loans deserve the title used behind closed doors in the industry. They are liar's loans. For the reasons we've just gone through, are you going to let your unsophisticated borrower hit the magic secret numbers in the term sheet that are going to maximize your bonus? You're going to leave it up to them? They don't know what the magic ratios are in loan to value. They don't know what the magic ratios are at debt to income. And you've got $20,000 riding on this. So seriously, you're going to leave it up to the borrower to get it right? Uh-uh. And all the evidence shows that they didn't. It was the lenders who put the lies in the liar's loans, and depositions will show that. And they'll show that very quickly in any of these cases. And that means also prosecutors can work their way up the food chain by flipping folks as well. Right? Because once you start making not just kind of bad loans, but unbelievably pathetic loans, you start a chain of lying. And that chain of lying, as Wendy said, had to go through everyone. Nobody could look honestly. Because if they looked honestly, this stuff wasn't just a little bit bad. It was horrifically bad. It could not withstand any honest examination. Any honest review instantly finds this stuff. And the whole thing breaks down. And who, what do they do? They create incentive structures that are perverse at every level so that people buy into it. And ultimately, it's the old joke. So, I uh, would give you a sub-sub point that uh, they didn't talk about for good reason. It's deliberately a sub-sub point. 
We have monoline insurers, and that just means single purpose insurers, who credit enhanced a lot of these CDOs. But they, they had, what, a billion in capital? Not even that. And they were supposedly credit enhancing a trillion dollars <laughs> of stuff. Now, can they pay? Of course they can't pay. So if you've got a, a $20 billion exposure to CDOs, you purchase CDOs, allegedly worth $20 billion. <coughs> At least you're out of pocket $20 billion. And you've got a claim for $20 million or $50 million on those things. Are you going to present that claim? Often they didn't. What you got was people for years not presenting really major claims against the monolines. Why? because they would have collapsed, right? They would have collapsed the first very large claim. Yeah? What about, this is maybe a very unsophisticated question, but I get this thrown at me occasionally, and uh, my thinking on it was partly occasioned by the big short, reading the big short. Mm -hmm. but what about the people that say, look, it, it couldn't have been a, a major fraud that everybody knew about, because so many of the big investment banks ended up being, being in a long position and, and taking a blood bath. Okay, so the famous article, or at least should be famous, again, a Nobel laureate, uh, and Paul Romer's not exactly a slouch either, uh, the title says it all, Looting the Economic Underworld of Bankruptcy for Profit. Remember what I said about this formula. It does destroy the firm, but it makes the officers incredibly wealthy, now, they can stay too long. They can make the bets. Nobody knows when the bubble will pop. So some people will, get, will stay too long. But overwhelmingly, what did CEOs do? They walked away extraordinarily wealthy. And indeed, it gets really interesting at the investment banks because the investment banks, for the reasons we talked about, are sophisticated. So if you're an investment bank, are you going to base people's <coughs> bonuses on simply the yield? Right, so I've got various investment managers handling portfolios at my at Merrill Lynch. It's a non-random example, by the way. Right? Am I going to pay people higher compensation simply because they invest in riskier assets? No, that'd be crazed, right? The place would go down within days if I did that. So we do it on a risk-adjusted <coughs> basis. Now, as Wendy said about the rating agencies, for, and, and Phil, first the rating agencies make sure that they never look at the underlying. Second, the rating agencies become consultants as well as raters. Third, they go to premium billing. And guess what virtually every tranche, top tranche, becomes of these CDOs? Triple A, right? Now, 5% of straight bonds roughly get triple A's, and 100% virtually of top tranche CDOs get triple A. Right? So that looks like a really, really, really low risk <laughs> investment under my firm's system. And I get a premium yield. So, if I'm an investment manager at Merrill Lynch, where do I put my money? So Merrill Lynch purchased this crap, knew it was crap, created CDOs, which it knew were crap, and then largely, compared to the others, kept it in portfolio because it goosed their earnings stream so much of the managers. Right? So yeah, does it kill Merrill Lynch? Absolutely, it kills Merrill Lynch. But is that inconsistent with fraud? No, because the whole problem in, in law jargon, modern law jargon, this is agency problems and econ jargon and such. But that's, you know, a bloodless phrase, again, a, a euphemism for fraud uh, in these circumstances. All right, I have to dash to the, uh, my next presentation at the other room.